Imagine a world where traditional search engines like Google are no longer the go-to for finding information. What if AI tools like ChatGPT are replacing our search habits and niche search engines are rising to the forefront? This is not a distant future. It's happening now. And Dwayne Forrester is here to break it down for us. This is Phraseology plus AI with your hosts, Philippe and Miguel Santos. As a digital marketing professional specializing in SEO for over 20 years, I've worked with companies from startups to the global Fortune 500. Learn how to gain an unfair advantage with AI as we uncover tips, tools, and strategies. Today, we're exploring the future of search and AI, the impact of AI as it evolves in terms of behaviors for customers. And of course, we've got the amazing Dwayne Forrester with us to talk through these things. So stay tuned for an insightful conversation about the future of search, of AI, and the challenge that we'll have to overcome to understand search as it's evolving and its future for us. So there's a lot going on, Dwayne, and obviously I know you're one of the, the most read in the room in terms of like knowing what's going on and having opinions on this. So I would love to kind of first ask you because we had a little pre-discussion on this Lex Friedman podcast, right? With Sam Altman. And I'd love to know a little bit more about what observations you took from that and perhaps like uh, your opinions on all that, because it was pretty fascinating. Okay. So first off, I have to frame a vision for you, Philippe. I'm in my Jeep. I'm driving from Southern California up to Monterey for a couple of meetings. I'm listening to this podcast as I'm driving along and I am shouting at my voice recorder all of these things that are occurring to me as I am taking in this. You know, I'm very tied to what's new and newsworthy in the industry or things that may affect the industry of search or kind of like are tangentially related. So the podcast and the interview that we're talking about is several months behind us now. And of course, I watched it, you know, the moment it came out, right? It cleared my calendar, spent the time there. And, you know, at the time, I just kind of like, took it all in with an open mind and thought, mm, okay, well, I know a few things. And I knew these things then. The CEOs have to follow a script. There are some things they can talk about, some things they cannot talk about. You know, anytime you represent a large brand, a public brand, you have to cultivate a talk track, basically. You will have written out things that you will talk about, some things you'll lean into, some things you won't lean into. And it was fascinating to me. Memories being what they are, they tend to shift things as you recall them. But I was pretty close to my original thought, which was, yeah, okay. Sam talked about some stuff that he, you know, that he could talk about. Didn't really talk about a lot of other stuff. Avoided a lot of the chat GPT-5, the voice stuff, search. In fact, he basically shrugged and kind of kicked the whole concept of search and Google and going after them and playing in that sandbox very elegantly to the curb. So much so that were you the interviewer, you may not have picked up on it and decided to follow that thread in any direction because it seemed like it was just so uninteresting to him that why would you go down that path? If he's not that interested in it, then obviously it wouldn't make for a good interview. So uh, the interview went on for two hours talking about a bunch of other different things, nuclear bunkers where they might be hiding things and fun stuff about how they're iterating and, and that kind of idea. And then we were just like, this is maybe four weeks ahead of the recent announcements. And I was rewatching it all. And it occurred to me, no, there's more coming here. So let's say you're a company that has a very large investor to the tune of billions of dollars. You are burning a lot of money in each month, each quarter to the tune of billions of dollars. You're looking for a way, obviously, to generate revenue from all of this new technology. It's not as easy as, hey, here's ChatGPT 4.7 and it now comes with ads. So you got to wait 30 seconds or 10 seconds to get your answer while we read an ad out loud to you. Like that's pretty inelegant. It does not match how the company was formed, their ethos, the direction they might move in. And yet, you know that a quarter point of market share in the search industry is worth like $1.6 billion quarterly. That's pretty tempting. I got to say, you know, and it happens to be that the largest investor in your organization also happens to be one of the largest tech companies in the world, which happens to own one of the largest search engines on earth. 
I would think maybe there might be not some direct influence, but at least the ability to learn and ask direct questions from someone who's been there, done that, and use that to maybe formulate your plan moving forward. I'm also pretty sure that there's always a proxy war going on between tech companies, <laughs> and this is just another version of it. Invest in this company. This company has a technological advantage in a new space. Therefore, you get to fight your arch enemy in a new way. It's asymmetrical warfare by tech company. It makes sense. We see this all the time in real life. This is just playing out in the tech world. And, you know, like it's exciting because we all get to see ChatGPT grow and we get to those of us, I'm, I'm a plus member, so I pay the $20 a month, have been since they offered it. And, you know, it's exciting to watch the capabilities grow and to do things. Like I asked this morning, I asked a basic math question and I was just being lazy. I was prepping for this call. So I didn't want to do the math in my head. I was like, I got to open this document, read this stuff. Oh, by the way, what's 40% of X and go. And it just came, it gave me the answer. And I'm like, whoa, hold on a second. Because last week, had I asked the same question, it would have said, oh, this is math. Hang on a second. Here's how we would figure this out. We would take this number and multiply it by this in this manner. Here's what the equation looks like. And therefore, if we do this math and we put this in for X and this in for Y, we get this. And I'm like, yeah, just want the baby, not the labor pains. You know, <laughs> this morning I got the baby just straight up, just straight up, no math. I asked it then prove your math. And it went into the long winded detail about all of it. But we're watching the growth of this technology. And now we hear Sam talking about, hey, search GPT. Oh, like we didn't know that was coming. Of course. And we've now got ChatGPT 5 is on the horizon. They're talking about that. They're talking about voice GPT. And there's early adopters available for that. By the way, if anyone at OpenAI sees this, reads it, likes my, you know, the way I'm, I'm going on about this stuff, please get me into the early access for that i will download and sign up and whatever but let's hope uh, for that because i wouldn't yeah, mind either <laughs> I love it, right i'd love it and i think that look for us it's exciting you know because we're at this front edge we're the people who used to walk into a grocery store you start up a conversation with somebody in line at the checkout and they'd say oh, what do you do for a living and you say to them i'm an seo and they'd be like what the hell is that and then you start talking about blah, 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 you'd mention the word digital, their eyes would glaze over and they would gratefully move forward and pay for their groceries. Today, you have that same conversation and you mention SEO and 70% of the time, the person says to you, oh, you do digital marketing. And it's like, huh, yeah, okay. But when we're talking about ChatGPT, well, a lot of people have heard of it. A lot of people don't make their living related to it. And we're still in that category. We're at the front end of this stuff, right? So super exciting to see these things. I've already been retraining myself. And I mean, you and I talked about this when we were prepping, like search is all about training human beings to take a specific behavior and repeat it. That's what Google did 25 plus years ago. You had a question, stick it in this box. We'll give you a reasonable answer. And if you can remember back that far, if you were a part of it when it launched, it sucked. It was limited. You had to be very pedantic about your question. Like it was many years and not a lot, but like three or four before we truly got to what we would recognize as a modern search engine, where you could just throw a phrase into the box and it would actually give you things that were pretty tightly related to it. And they've spent 27 years. No, it's about 26 years now because I have actually, oh, I've been doing this longer than they've existed as a domain. So it's kind of crazy to see that whole right. lineage, right? right? Like all of that change. It's, I remember launching my first website going, what the hell do I do with this? And then finding a thing called the keywords tag and being like, well, what if I just repeat this keyword 15 times and then going into dog pile and hitting refresh and I was number one and then hitting refresh mm -hmm. and I was number three and then going in and being like, oh, you said it 17 times. Well, I'm going to say it a hundred times. And it just like, this brinkmanship of what I think of as experimental stupidity. And along the way, we learned how to exploit a search engine. Now, Google was a bit more refined and became rapidly more refined than those other systems. Uh, but then so did we in our exploits. And, you know, so, so we spent most of 25 years with that same paradigm. Type your words in a box and you get an answer, but you still have to do the work. And humans don't read the search results, they scan them, which is why the words that you thought to write in the box are bolded on the page. 
because Google knows that's the only way to connect that in your mind quickly. So maybe you'll click on something and then you'll feel satisfied and you'll stay with Google longer. So there's more of a chance that you'll click on an ad. Like there's so much psychology at play with everything that we do. Now, how do you shift all that into the world of AI? If you ask a question out loud, how do I optimize for the question that the human invents? I won't know what it is. I won't see it. I won't hear it. And chances are the way you and I would both ask for something, they may differ slightly. Each one of those is unique. So as an SEO, how do you optimize? Or do you optimize for both variations? Or do you trust that the system will know that, oh, it's the same question. So we'll just, you know, disambiguate and, and the answers end up the same, even though the questions are slightly different. Wait, so but that, that's exactly what I wanted to ask you about, because like you were talking about that interview, right? And clearly there's an opportunity for open AI. There's clearly an opportunity for AI to take over some of the stuff that we're getting through search or we have been getting for the last 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned some very interesting things about the psychology of that interview. And I think I, I would love to just explore that a little bit more about how you kind of saw this fitting into the unwritten answers of that podcast, because that's like super interesting to me too. So I'm, I am probably over the last five to 10 years, I've become very fascinated with body language. And look, I started learning how to meditate 30 years ago in life, and I still suck. Uh, I don't know that you ever become great at meditating, but it's not about achieving the goal, it's about you know, the journey along the way. And so learning to read body language is a similar path, right? Like you will spend a lifetime learning the nuances. But when you watch somebody answer questions and they are moving in their chair, they are nodding, they are making eye contact, they're using hand gestures. And then the next question you get, the person is very still, very calm and answers with dismissive language, not negative, but language designed to stop the exploration of the topic. It becomes pretty clear, pretty quick that that's a hot button issue. And there's no reason for it to be a hot button issue unless you actively do not want to touch it. Not because you're afraid of anything, not because you're concerned about it, but probably because you're working on it. And the more people ask you about it, the more you have to veer into the territory of being misleading. You don't want to do that. That's the vibe that I'm getting when I rewatch that, that podcast, that interview. You see it at key points where there's some animation and then there's absolutely none. And absolutely none is tied to those moments in time that we are now seeing that are now the talking points. GPT-5, which we were told, don't know when it's coming out. And the question was, is it coming out soon? Don't know. And mm -hmm. then there was search. Nope, not interested in that. Don't want to play that game. Which itself was a fascinating statement because if you look at, and we're going to touch on this in a minute, if you look at consumer behavior, and how it's impacting search today, the phrase from somebody who could launch a search engine saying, I don't want to play that game. That is eye-opening to me. Because what you don't want is you don't want to show up to the game and say, I'm going to replicate something that started 25 years ago. And the reason you don't want to replicate that is shift happens. And it is happening right now. You don't have to look very far to see that as a generation or as generations go, the shift is already happening. So I'll start us off with a, a small story from a friend. He was at his daughter's, you know, bring your parent to work day and that kind of thing, career day. And he walked up in front of the class and said, you know, I do digital marketing. I help people get ranked higher on Google. And one of the kids in the class, these kids are like nine and 10 years old. Uh, she raises her hand and he says, yes, you have a question. She goes, yeah. She goes, can you explain what Google is? She goes, I hear my parents talk about it all the time, but I never go there. And he didn't know if like this kid was joking. Okay. This is gen alpha. So let's just put that generational mark up there. This is gen alpha. Okay. So let's call this a 10 year old child. They are six to seven years away from maybe having their first job and having money of their own and making purchase decisions. Let's be clear at 10 years old, they're already guiding purchase decisions in their home. So like they get the power of commerce. They understand the basics of how this all works. 
this kid is straight faced asking like, what is Google and why does it matter? That is a bright and shining beacon. So one of two things I believe is true. He encountered someone's idiot child, literally like the most uneducated, underexposed, <laughs> you know, separated from society child ever. Or this kid is like a sample of one that actually represents most Gen Alpha, which is, yeah, they're starting their queries on TikTok and Snap. That's where they go to ask questions. And they want those personalities that they follow giving the answers to the questions. They don't want a list of anything to read through. They're not reading through anything. It would be like me saying, well, okay, I've known Philip for 15 years in the industry. He's smart. He knows what he's talking about. Hey, man. What's going on with the latest Google update? And then you telling me what's going on with the latest Google update. I don't particularly feel like I need to go get more information about it. I have a general download from you. That's what Gen Alpha is going for in queries and responses. They're not doing it on Google because Google is still read me and they won't do that. You see this generational change happening. They're moving to social media to ask these questions on these platforms. And now you've got ChatGPT, which a hundred million active users a week are in that thing asking it questions and look you can you know come at me and tell me it's a large language model it's all about predictive it's not a search engine blah 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 it doesn't matter what matters is the perception of the consumer if i go and ask it a question and it answers me and my perception is that answer is accurate and it is fast and it is trustworthy, I'm done. But what I am doing is I'm contributing to retraining my own behavior. The faster you can get me to microphone, ask out loud, you understand me, I get my answer back again, the more it's like me asking you, can you tell me the latest update from Google and you explaining it to me? It feels like a peer-to-peer -peer interaction. Humans, by our very nature, are genetically programmed to seek out shortcuts to accomplish work. It's all about burning calories and our brains are the biggest hogs on burning calories in our bodies. If I can hack my way to the answer instead of thinking my way to the answer, that's a lot more appealing to me. It releases different hormones and different chemicals in my brain and my response that I get to those things is better and leans more toward pleasure. So asking out loud, getting the answer out loud, tickles my pleasure centers, makes me feel better, makes me feel like I have actually done something that was good for me. And yeah, I also got the answer along the way. And <laughs> you don't get that when you have to type something into a box and you get a list of things to scan through, and then maybe you find one. We are absolutely on the verge of hybrid search engines. We've already seen what I call the splinter net happening, but as soon as we have AI agents available to each one of us, which I believe will really start happening later this fall, once we have those things happening, then I'm gonna be able to program my own Philippe bot and it will have your voice, your likeness, and it will do my bidding, anything I want. Philippe, put stuff on my grocery list. Philippe, place an order with bonds to get my cart started. Like, And that will be the very core of how I change my personal behavior how I no longer go and search as a verb, I talk out loud and then I get what I wanted. Wait, <laughs> a couple of things come to mind which are hilarious here, right? <laughs> First of all, yes, having a virtual twin or having like your own bot that's uh, yeah. in the likelihood of somebody else, that's funny enough. <laughs> but I mean, just imagine people are already frustrated with folks talking on their phone in, in the public yeah. places. Imagine when this happens. Yes, it makes it easier on our life, but it's also going to be annoying as heck. <laughs> you know, yes and no. I think the behavior, so we've long ago crested the mountain where, you know, you're, you're walking down the street and you see somebody talking out loud and you think, I should call the police. They're a raving lunatic. Like the early days of cell phones, we saw that. We saw an uptick in people calling the police to report strange behavior with the advent of remote earbuds and whatnot. We had that double take and side eye growth that happened where people were like, are they on a call or are they just talking to themselves? And today you see people wandering around all the time, just their lips are moving, they're talking in low voice. And your first assumption is they're on a phone call. That's your first assumption now, not that they're a raving lunatic, but that they're on a phone call. 
And so I think what's going to happen with this is, yeah, you are going to have people talking to their device more. And a lot of that is going to be like just chatter in the background that I don't need to hear. It'll be annoying, but no more so than what we already face. And you also have to take into consideration that there are, you know, a lot of technologies like our headsets that we wear and bone conductive microphones and speakers, like you can almost sub vocalize in a lot of cases, they'll never hear you and your system will pick it up just fine. I, I see a lot of that happening. To give you an idea of how advanced some of this stuff is. That trip I described earlier, I was driving up to Monterey and I was listening to the podcast. I started asking ChatGPT questions and almost an hour later, I stopped the conversation. It was a 48 minute long conversation with ChatGPT on the topics that I pulled from that. And my initial interest was to get ChatGPT to do some research for me while I was driving because I had access to a 5G connection, but I'm driving. So I can't really be, you know, typing on my phone, but I still, while it was all fresh in my mind, wanted to go through and ask the question and get the links so I could then go review my history in ChatGPT and take all that information and use it to write articles from. And it ended up being a 48 minute long conversation where I realized I have to stop like, like this person, and I'm air quoting person, this person will just keep going. There is no end to the conversation with these systems. You have to stop because they'll just keep filling in the blanks for you. Every question, every idea. And then they'll ask, you know, do you want to get back onto this topic? Oh yeah. Okay, great. I found more information. Here's what I found related to that topic. This is massive growth for these systems. And now to say, oh yeah, okay. Full voice interface. Awesome. That's going to be fun. Um, and on top of that, search GPT. Yep. All right. So now it's really hard to argue that this is not a search engine, that it's just an LLM that's predicting the next word. And I've never really bought that argument because ChatGPT was plumbed into Bing. So if you asked it a question and it needed to research, it went to Bing and did the search and then brought the information back. There was, that's not predictive. That's here are the results. So mm, it's, we are at a very, very important inflection point with all of this. And we haven't even started talking about the impact that this change in consumer behavior has on businesses, on market share, on a lot of things. And it's going to be big. This isn't just, you know, people stop using Google, right? What we have to be talking about is this has the power to wholesale redefine what the word search means. It redefines how consumers today and in the future think about information retrieval. To be fair, no consumer is thinking about those two words, but that is the action that they are taking. They are coming online saying, I have a problem. How do I solve it? There's a big difference between saying, I'm going to grab a coffee and I'm going to spend the next hour researching this and saying, I'm going to grab a coffee and I'm going to have my AI assistant research this while I go do X. Those are yeah. worlds apart. And you suddenly have a utility in one version that does not exist in the other. The other demands your time. My time is hyper valuable and I shouldn't be putting it in a lot of places in my life. My concern is that one of those areas we're going to look at in five years and say, I shouldn't be put my time in it is typing words in a box. That's what I think happens here because I have an AI agent who will go do that work. This is huge. Well, you, you definitely got me thinking a little bit here because just not too long ago, I spoke to Ann Smarty specifically mm -hmm. about this and who is actually going to kill Google finally, right? And it seems like the thing that could hurt or kill Google is this, the threat of like search engines from open AI and, and just AI as a technology, if Google doesn't kind of get their ship in order for the behavioral change. And you mentioned that people are using chat GPT, perplexity and social media platforms like TikTok and YouTube to do a lot of their searching now or discovery, let's say discovery of content. Right. What do you think these implications are like for the shift? For all, all folks related to marketing, to SEO, and to just like entrepreneurs themselves, what should they be thinking about? And should, how should they be kind of framing this for their own success? First and foremost, we're going to start this with, you should be on every platform right now. And I know that's a lot of work, but you need to be on Instagram. You need to be on TikTok. You need to be on Facebook. You need to be on X. You need to be on threads. You need to be on all the new ones. You need to be on Snap. You need to have an understanding about 
what the kids today are doing. So look for the research that's coming out of companies like Snap. They every quarter put out reports on what's popular with their system. Well, what's popular with their system is a direct correlation to what's popular with their users. And a quick search will show you that most of their users are well under 20 years old. So it's not a big leap to say whatever that behavior is, is going to carry throughout those people's lives. The other thing that nobody thinks of, I've been talking about this for the last year and a half to two years, the Fortune 500. I think we're all familiar with it, right? And you can call Fortune 50, the Fortune 100, the Fortune 1000, however long you want to make the list. It started, uh, if I remember my research, maybe in the mid 50s, like 56, 57, is when that list started. And at that time, if you looked, and I'm going to get this number wrong, but this number doesn't really matter. It's the number that's going to follow it that matters. But if you looked at that time, the average age of a corporation on that list was somewhere around 60 or 5 years old. Now, remember, this is the heyday of Sears. This is the heyday of all of these huge brands. This is the beginning of brands that lasted for a generation or two and then went away. I'm thinking of Kmart. And, and these types of institutions that generations of people grew up with, and now it's a nostalgic meme. 2025, the average age of those companies is going to be 16 years. Crazy. Google is 27 years old. So Google is past its prime, according to this math. Microsoft, you could argue, should be long dead and buried. But here's the key difference. At specific and strategic times in history, Microsoft has reinvented itself. It's gone from a software company to a SaaS company, to a search company, to a cloud company, to an AI company. So each one of these iterations exposes the company to new generations as a new version of the company, effectively resetting the clock from an investor standpoint when new investors come on board. The biggest problem for Google is it is a noun, it is a verb, it is tied to search, it is search, it invented search. Therefore, it can only and ever will be search. So couple that with a lack of early investment. And I'm saying that, just be clear, I have no idea what actual investment Google was making. It's easy for me to claim it was a lack of early investment. That's why they're playing catch up and saying these things. I know the flip side of that coin is very real. They have a ton of smart people working on exactly these programs. In fact, if you read all the news this morning, Last night, the reporting was that Google's latest models is actually trumping everything, including ChatGPT 4.0 in all the testing right now. So it's a little disingenuous for us to all be running around saying Google's behind the curve and they can't catch up, these kinds of things, right? They can. They do, however, have to protect the revenue, which comes from search. So it's never an easy situation for them to walk in and say, ah, oh, let's make a change. It's super easy for OpenAI to come in and say, let's launch a search engine with no ads. Well, you're not making any money now anyhow, and you're not expected to make any money right now. And actually launching a search engine is the easy part of all this. That's the easy part now. Go get an index, not a problem. We've got a partner in Bing. There we go, we have an index. Or just send a crawler out and collect the web and stick it on one of those servers you've got, those 350,000 servers. Stick it on that, you're fine. And ultimately, I think what erodes Google, because I don't believe that Google goes away. I think that Google settles at a new level. You know, if we look at data right now, it's like Google is, depending on the report that you read, Google is anywhere between 68 and 93% market share of search. The, the reality here is, though, that <laughs> the problem we face is that query starts are happening. So when those reports come out saying Google is 93% of the market, that assumes that we're taking all of the search activity into consideration. The reports that report on social media spaces don't report on query starts. So the search reports don't include social media locations, only search engines. So you could easily see the world of search queries in the world of search drop down and Google could still own 10,000 or 93% of 10,000 queries. It would still be 93%, but it would be a meaninglessly small number. 
because the query activity has moved to social media platforms and that's where people are getting their start. And so I think that while AI is causing some stumbling, I can at least say that and feel pretty good about it. I don't know that AI, it doesn't stop Google. It may, what we would consider to be hurt them. They may lose a couple of points of market share. They may lose 50 points of market share. I don't really know, but it doesn't stop them. I think the biggest threat, and this threat is to every single business, is generational change. And I will sum it up this way. We don't listen to our parents' music. And that is an incredibly important lesson for everyone to understand. I'm Gen X. I'm all about the 80s and 90s. And my mom is all about the 50s. And I don't listen to that music. She does. I don't. So everything that I listen to is a much more advanced version of what she listened to. Electric guitar, synthesizer. Like, these things are worlds apart. And that holds true with pretty much everything we consume in our lives. There are very few institutions that stand the test of time and last for 100 years, especially now, with the way everything is so interconnected. A friend sent me a video last night. It's an astrophotography video, because whenever we go out camping, we do a lot of astrophotography. And he sent me this video from a guy in Australia doing this thing and it was like an 11 minute video. And in the first three minutes, I was on Amazon ordering the phone holder that this guy was using to shoot these images with his iPhone 15. And then I was downloading the app that he uses to stitch them all together and paying the $6 for the app. Like that's the speed at which things go. He produced that video 11 days ago in Australia. And now I'm buying that consumer product here. I haven't even finished watching the video and I'm already making consumer decisions based around it. You know, that type of speed never existed in our parents' time. And we will not be able to imagine what it will be like for those kids asking, what's Google? And I hear my parents talking about it, but I never go there. Like they're working mm -hmm. at a different pace and from a different point of view. I think that it's incredibly important businesses understand this as well. If that kid can say, what's Google? There, what's the hope for your brand? I mean, now we are seeing a resurgence with Gen Alpha, where the tail end of Gen Z, where they're preferring in-person engagements. So they're liking going back to shopping malls. They're liking going into stores and buying things in person. That was going out the door as millennials aged and then Gen Z started to take over, but it's shifting. So what the business needs to take away is Look, you've got to have a clean footprint. You have to fill in all the blanks. You have to use things like structured data, technical SEO. Stop talking about it. Get that crap done. Don't come to me and say, I've got a plan this year and here's where I'm going to do it. Don't care. You're a dinosaur. I, your toys are us. I expect you to be gone if that's your conversation. What I do expect, however, is the people that are quietly executing on all this stuff are actually going to reap the rewards. And by the way, the technical stuff, I'm touching on it here. I don't care. I don't think any of the engines care either. The care about is the content, the quality, the expertise, the authority, the trust. That's where they care. Look, EEAT from Google, this is not some made up BS that Google's trying to get people to swallow. If you think about how you want answers to questions when you ask them, you will see that your own expectations almost perfectly line up with EEAT in every case where you choose to take the answer from who you choose to trust when you're doing your research the things that you will put time into versus ignore these are all very clear signals and google has distilled it down and shared it with everybody in a handy acronym and why businesses aren't making this their mantra and leaning into it i don't know except i do know because it's not fast quick or easy to create content oh and you've got to be leaning into video these days You've got to be okay being on camera because that's how people want to get their answers and they want to trust you and know that you are trustworthy and recognize you. This is part of the reason why we see a lot of AI personalities and AI influencers growing because the consumer doesn't actually care. They don't care that it's Philippe or Philippe bot. They care that sounds reasonable, is helpful, answers questions, knows what they're talking about, is trustworthy. Other people say he is trustworthy. They, they don't actually care if you drink motor oil or coffee. Robot, <laughs> human. Mm. And, and there's going to be more of that in the future. And look, I know most of the people listening and watching this are going to say, oh, but I care. 
yeah, well, look, the fact that you're tuned into this, you are not a good sample for what's going on in the real world. <laughs> you're way too close to this stuff and it makes a difference. And look, we are going to see, I think as we see the evolution of all of this through new technologies, we are going to see what is happening. We see this happening with Reddit. The open web is, is literally in a threat situation. Look, Google has access to Reddit stuff, but if anybody else wants it, they have to pay. Well, that makes it difficult for any other search engine to have access. I think we're actually going to start seeing a growth of niche search engines. You know, you're a tennis player and uh, you want to corner the market on everything to do with tennis. You're going to create your own tennis-based search engine and everything in the index is going to be the total index, but it's all going to be tuned toward tennis. And then you will tune your advertising toward that and you will develop a following of people who know if you want tennis, go here. And this is what is going to end up happening as we move forward. And I think it's because it's hard for large search engines, Google, Bing, you know, pretty much every one of them. It's hard to curate everything. It's a lot. That's expensive. It's top heavy. Your index has information in it that is randomly accessed, but costs you to maintain and so I think, you know, if you could visualize what the index looks like at a major search engine like Google, you would see that it's very well defined across the top. It has some fairly well defined edges at the very outside of all topics, you know, across humanity. And the bottom is kind of dangling and dripping and it's losing bits and pieces of the internet because nobody ever goes in there. Nobody ever touches this stuff. It's old information. It's not, you know, like one person every two years goes to look for it. And Google's saying, well, that costs me money. So I'm just going to drop that because I don't need to fulfill for that one person every two years. I'd rather them fail and not get the answer than keep the cost on my end and come through for them. I think that capturing all those bits and pieces is incredibly important. It's really going to be what feeds a lot of niche areas. And those niche areas will just continue to have their own value. Well, as consumers just want answers and they won't go somewhere to ask a question and read, and they just want it spoken aloud to them, those types of indexes, those niche indexes are going to become incredibly valuable to power all of these AI front ends with the answers that we need. So yeah, we're already getting that model, right? <laughs> Through like GPTs and yeah. all of that. You want to know what the businesses need to focus on? This is what the businesses need to focus on. I really need you to stop focusing on whether an H1 beats an H2 or how many characters are in your meta description, or if I put the keyword at the beginning of this paragraph versus halfway through this paragraph, like are not problems you need to solve. What you need to solve is, do you truly know who your client is, your customer? Do you know where they are? Do you know how they're asking questions? Because I guarantee you, Google Search Console, Bing Webmaster Tools, they are not giving you these answers. That There is nothing valuable for them to give you those answers, to fill in that blank for you, which is why they don't supply that data. Like no. Google Search Console isn't going to suddenly start saying, here's all the conversational stuff that's happening through AI and all of the, the voice inputs. Here's what that maps to as keywords and phrases and topics. They're, they're not going to do that. That's a lot of work for no ROI. I know I built and launched Bing Webmaster Tools. There is no positive ROI directly for the tools. It exists in service to something. And it, we are going to see massive, massive change for businesses. I think there's a lot of opportunity here. Anytime there's chaos, there's opportunity. Oh. Perfect segue, Dwayne, which is really the role of AI in search and SEO. And specifically, yeah. I, I had I thought we were really on to something that was interesting, which is when you talked about hallucinations and why that is not so that should not be mm -hmm. the main focus of a lot of conversations because you feel like that's changing. I would love to like lo know a little bit more and maybe the audience. You know, it's fascinating to me. My gut reaction on this is that like any learning system, even humans, for example, if you asked a 10 year old to describe how to drive an automobile, like how to drive a car, okay? You get a rudimentary explanation from their limited time on earth, collecting information on that topic. Come back and ask that same question of a 20 year old who's been driving for four years and has their own automobile, and you will get a much, much updated version 
of the answer. So anytime we're having a conversation and we're going to start saying, oh, hallucination is a problem, what I'm hearing is you're not paying attention to how these systems grow. You would rather things stay historically bad because you get to repeat the same phrase over and over again. Oh, hallucinations are bad. And look, I, I agree. If I'm going to ask you about financial information, I'm going to ask you about medical information. I personally believe <clears throat> the hallucination rate should be zero. Okay. We're back to your money or life categories. This is why we've seen Google, I think, roll back so much of the AI overview coverage. It started, it was 60 some percent of queries. And the last number I heard was like 7%. I kind of stopped paying attention to it because we're tracking something that obviously has a trend. I don't need to know what the actual number is, but Google is right-sizing it for the areas that it knows it can completely trust it versus the areas where it still needs to learn. And that makes complete sense. But I guarantee you this, if you go look up the jobs that are open and you look up at Google, Apple, um, TikTok, Amazon, Microsoft, the big companies, OpenAI, you look at headcounts that are available for things like AI engineer, you will see that they have hundreds of current open headcount at any one time. So if they fill even a fraction of that and add to the dozens or hundreds of people they already have deployed on solving these problems, and I will point out that these are minimum master's levels people, nine times out of 10, these are multi PhD holders. I think it is safe to agree these are intelligent people. I don't necessarily need to be at a cocktail party with them, perhaps maybe not the most socially stimulating conversations. However, if you were given the task of solving hallucinations in AI, I can't think of smarter people to put to work on it than these groups of individuals. And they're working on this problem now have been since before we even knew ChatGPT was a thing. Like since before any of this launch, they knew about the problem and are working to solve it. So you can't come at me and say, oh, hallucinations are a problem without admitting that we've dramatically improved and it will continue to improve. In fact, we will reach a point, my guess is in the next two years, we will reach a point where if you're saying hallucinations are a problem, you do not understand the, at that point, state of the art of these systems because hallucinations are not going to be a part of the conversation. And the fact that these systems are able to access a lot more information, that they're able to fact check themselves, it solves the problem for us and we can stop talking about it, right? I don't even remember the name of it now, but we used to chase the frequency of words and keywords within a page, right? And that was a big deal in search. Plus because, I, right? I, exactly. It was part of that <laughs> whole conversation. And I'm like, holy crap, I can't believe we're talking about this again. Like if you're in the commerce area or e-commerce area, I don't think hallucination is a problem for you in terms of what these systems are doing. If you're in finance and you're in healthcare, yeah, I'd still be, you know, concerned about that. Yeah. But th these systems are moving so fast and they're evolving so quickly. It, just like the conversations we're having month to month go stale immediately. Well, I love your anecdote about the 10 year old and the 20 year old, because the thing is that is exactly how the learning process happens. But of course, with these systems, there's much more muscle behind this oh. and it's not going to take 10 years to get those oh. answers refined. That's the crazy <laughs> thing. They, so look, if you gave them 10 years to learn something, you're looking at like a billion generations of that system evolving trillions of generations forward in 10 years of our real time, right? They're evolving hourly, daily. And, and so, you know, why are we talking about hallucinations? Well, I mean, there's one consideration I think that might play in here, right? Dwayne, now cor correct me if you think I'm wrong here, but large companies can employ these armies of really qualified engineers and professionals that are looking at this problem. Smaller companies that are creating their small language models or coming up with their own form of information that's protected behind their own uh, technology and infrastructure mm -hmm. may not have that same opportunity. So our tools are going to be developed for better hallucination response that are going to be made for smaller companies? Or do you think that some things are just going to still take a long time? So yeah, this gets us kind of in the conversation of that old bugaboo of build versus buy. I early on was a big proponent of buy versus build uh, when it came to AI. The costs involved of building your own AI are astronomical in terms of time, in terms of resources, and in terms of pure dollars, just the money involved. Pretty much no 
enterprise level can afford it. If the enterprise level group is getting knocked off that list, they are in a better position to buy, like it's better to buy and they can go buy. Tools developed for them to buy so that it speeds their adoption and their use cases and solutions. That will inevitably trickle down to mid-market. Then you'll have service providers, SaaS companies coming in saying, let us tap in to that high end. And for a middleman fee, we'll give you more tools. And then you can do more with your information and it will piggyback on this. What we're actually starting to see now is the advent of that for SMBs, where mm -hmm. tools are starting to exist for SMBs from providers to allow SMBs access to it. Because to be crystal clear, even the largest of enterprise companies doesn't actually have a large data set compared to what an LLM needs or is capable of managing. So I guarantee you no SMB, no medium-sized company has a data set so big that it needs an LLM. It's just not the way it is. But again, generationally, you train from, you need 15 billion parameters in order to have an LLM that is coherent. Well, now you can go into a small language model that only needs 150,000 parameters. And the reason it only needs it is because we've had so many generations of 15 billion that you've built the skeleton so it can stand on its own now and not fall over. So it knows basic things like how to blink its eyes, how to raise its hand, how to stand upright, how to breathe. And the small language model is the, how do I comb my hair? Can I pluck my eyebrow? The nuance things, the detailed pieces. And we're not quite there yet. We still have several years before these services are reliable for SMBs. Right now, what we see are tools integrating things, targeting SMBs, mid-market enterprise with specific ideas. Like, hey, here's something that will help you write things, make your writing better. Okay, that's great, but that's one thing. What I need is you to also not just help my content writing team, but I need you to help my product planning team understand trends based on our selling and our sales data and data across the internet for these people who buy these products that we sell, I want to know what the trends are. When are they likely to be interested in buying more? When are they going to shift and want to buy something different? All of that, if you put the data into the right models, you can get insights back out of. And that, that's not quite there yet, right? Companies are claiming they have it. It's not quite there. It's a little kludgy. It's hard to work with, but we'll get there. Grammarly wasn't that easy to use when it first came out. And some people will say it's still not that great today. But look, I've worked in a place where we used it and it was great. It helped people. It, it increased productivity. Things get better. They improve over time. I don't think we fully understand what that time frame looks like right now with all of the AI stuff. I think it's vastly accelerated, way, way faster than anything we're used to. Yeah. I You did mention quite a bit about technical SEO and its uh, value and how it's diminishing over time, but that it's still here. I don't know if you want to go a little bit into why you think that is. Well, I think what's happening here is it's just basically commoditized, you know, like the basic package you might get from a company like Wix or GoDaddy, the basic installation from a WordPress installation. You've got Yoast SEO plugin and a host of others. I call it Yoast because I happen to know the founders and we're old friends and that was the tool that I used in all my blogs. But there are lots, right? All in one SEO plugin, like all kinds of different things. Bottom line is it's not particularly difficult to do good technical SEO today. And I'm looking at this from a perspective across the internet. I fully agree that there are a ton of customized CMSs out there and technical SEO on them is difficult. But the technical SEO on the platform isn't really the difficulty. The difficulty is convincing your IT team to give you resources to do the work. That's the difficulty in technical SEO today, not the actual code level work. The code level work is only as difficult as it ever was at one point. It is in a lot of ways, a copy and paste exercise. You write what you need to add, you paste it into the code, you publish it, and now you have that feature, that functionality you've canonicalized, you've done whatever. Uh, and we have co-pilots now. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> I added something to one of my personal blogs recently and it was, a, it was a search box and I was testing it. And I'm like, oh my, it's been 
decades since I've written CSS or HTML. And so I'm like, ah, ChatGPT, I need to integrate this piece of code for this functionality into this page of code. How can I do it? Please give me the output and highlight the addition, 12 seconds. And I copy and pasted character for character out of my window, back into my text, pasted that, published it on the website, hit, re hit uh, refresh, and there I had a new search box. And I'm just like, oh, look at that. Turns out I'm, I'm a different type of coding idiot. Great, whatever, it worked. <laughs> Moving on, you know? I, like, like, I feel bad that I lost all those skills, but at the same time, I'm like, I don't necessarily need them now. Like, okay, moving on. I think that's a little dangerous. That's the thing, though. You know? That's the thing, though. We reformat, we reformat our brain all the time. So if we're not using yeah. something, we're saying, well, there's something more valuable I'd like to put there. Well, and that's, I mean, you know, I think we tell ourselves that, Philippe, but a lot of times, you know, the more valuable, <laughs> more valuable thing we're replacing with is the second generation of Beavis and Butthead being launched. So, you know, like, I don't know if it's more valuable, <laughs> but, you know, the space was used. Let's just say that, right? You know, RAM has been filled. I think that technical will always play a role in this. I do believe we have a future where crawling is going to become less. The search engines will move away from it because it's expensive and they want to limit costs. I think we'll have a future where we will have knowledge graph to knowledge graph plugins, where you will need to build your website on a knowledge graph so you can take an output from that, give it to Google and then they will take it and plug it into their knowledge graph. It saves them from having to go crawling. If you are trusted and vetted, then the data flows back and forth and they have instant access to it. It offloads some of the compute. It offloads a lot of the cost. The other thing that ends up happening in that world is we then do start to see another version of, I'm using the word splinternet. By the way, I didn't coin that phrase. It comes from something that was going on in the late 1980s, early 1990s on the internet. If folks want to look it up, I'm not claiming that I invented it, but I am applying it here. Um, and you're going to see that there are websites plugged in to the backbone and websites that are not plugged into the backbone. And that's going to be a bit of a differentiator for, for businesses. And that is a technical aspect. You know, from the content side, boy, oh boy, let's just go straight back to EEAT and, and you better be answering all the questions. You know, like I, this is the advice that I give everybody. You come to me with a piece of uh, like with a question and a piece of content, and you say, "I think this is good content." You know, I followed all of our best practices, all of our rules and whatnot. And I'm going to say your rules and best practices are crap because that's you inventing something that you're agreeing to follow. That's pretty limited. Take your question and your answer and give it to all your family and all your friends. Give them the question without the answer and see how they answer it and see how close your answer is and what you missed. Because I guarantee you, you do that with 20 or 30 people, your answer is going to be way more robust than you originally thought. And you thought yours was awesome because you followed your guidelines. And I'm not saying the guidelines don't have a place, right? But if you invent your own guidelines and then you follow them, you can hardly reward yourself and say, this is excellent. That's a bit of an echo chamber, right? So when you look at these things, you need to look beyond yourself. And this is where using AI systems can be hugely helpful. Another aspect of it that's hugely helpful is, you know, d don't spend your time coming up with ideas, like just a few bullet points and a concept of what you want. Give it to ChatGPT 4.0 and tell it, create a list of 20 topics, and it will go and create that list of 20 topics. 16 of them will be crap. Three of them will be not too bad. One of them is a winner. Just keep telling ChatGPT, create another list, don't repeat anything. Before you know it, you got five or six things that are absolute winners. And then you can go back and say, okay, give me a rough outline, 200 words on this. This is what I need. Cite your sources. Give me the links, that kind of thing. Now you've actually got a draft of a document that you can start writing from. And you're going to put, produce higher quality content because you're more on point. So I like it, there's so much here for productivity and, and for creativity that this is going to unlock and boost. It's going to be huge for, for companies and businesses. And we haven't even talked about creating explainer videos, just telling the system, create an explainer video that does this and it creates everything. And then if you want to go all through all the work, you could create a trademark character and put them into all of your videos. Like it's, it's mind blowing how useful these utilities can be. That's true. And, and one of my last questions for you that I think is kind of interesting here. You mentioned technologies or kind of follows like index. Now you, you mentioned a little bit about how tech SEO is diminishing. And of course you talked about niche search engines and the, the, the mm -hmm. way that things are going to go in the future. 
So uh, really like what kind of skills, what kind of mindsets do you think marketers and uh, particularly marketers and entrepreneurs need to consider right now so that they can be on the cutting edge and so that they're not paralyzed by all of this information. And of course, some of the fatigue that comes with AI. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to throw some concepts at you here fully because like this doesn't really flow in a, a linear fashion, but first mm -hmm. off, foremost, people need to understand the concept of a T-shaped marketer. So that, that is not a new concept. People can research that. The basics behind it, you need to have a strength in a core area and then competencies across other areas within marketing. Now apply that to digital marketing. If you are a core deep tech SEO, you also have to have a fairly deep competency in content and in a number of other areas related to digital marketing. Um, part of that I'm going to say is um, developing a competency around consumer behavior and being able to get that research, understand that research, translate that research into product management and then developing project management. So there's two more skills that I think are really important, product management and project management. I also am going to challenge everyone to be curious. A So if you're going to come to me and say that ChatGPT is not a search engine, I'm going to say you're not curious enough. What there's things about this that you're because you have a it's this and only this point of view, you are blocking access to other things that could be happening that are important for you to understand. So you may be looking at it saying social media is the death of society. It's killing us. It's destroying our children's brains. Yeah. OK, I, I get it. I'm not going to argue with you on the point. What I am going to say, though, is you need to be on every one of the modern social media channels. You have to have an active presence. And I don't mean, oh, I have an account and I watch stuff. I mean, you actually have to be participating so you understand the ecosystem that your consumers are a part of. So mm -hmm. that's the critical part. So watching TikTok, for me, watching TikTok is less about the content I'm consuming. It's more about how the platform is changing and monetizing and the things it's doing to interrupt my flow to try to get me involved in commerce in some way. And so I derive less pleasure from TikTok, but I still spend 45 minutes to an hour a day in there. I'll go through and watch the channels that I want and that I get value from, but then I'll just go through the For You page and I'll see how they are evolving, what they are doing. Because all of these things they're doing are basically traps where they get people's attention and they keep it. And if people are there, they're not going anywhere else, which then means as a business owner, you better be producing content that can actually be seen by people on TikTok. So now you have to understand, well, how does the search work in TikTok? Is it hashtag based? Is it keyword based? What are people looking for? How are they searching? Oh, you know what? I should probably look up a generational slang translator so that I understand the difference between lit and fire. Because if I want to use those things, it's going to impact which generation is seeing my hashtags and my words and everything. Like there's so much that needs to be accounted for. If you're just doing the same old thing you've been doing for 10 years, you're falling behind. And if you're not falling behind, you will very shortly be falling behind. I love that perspective. And I agree with you. So with that, <laughs> Dwayne, I would love for you to give your three best tips or pieces of advice that you think folks could really use right now. Absolutely. Number one, just mentioned this one, be curious. Don't look at these new things that are coming up and say, oh crap, another new thing. No, no. Look at it and say, how can I learn and exploit this for the benefit of my business? Take that perspective on it. You'll lean in a little more. Um, number two, consumer behavior. The data is out there. Get in, dig in, look at it. Because if you think that Google sets direction, you're mistaken. Consumer behavior tells Google where it needs to go. So you cannot look at this and say, I'll follow Google. No, no, no. The, Google's already following someone else. So you should pay attention to what that other person is doing. And those are the general consumers. Number three, look, don't be afraid to reach out to people. Don't be afraid to connect. Don't be afraid to ask questions. This industry that we are a part of is so interconnected and so open with their knowledge. Absolutely. If you're a business owner or you're curious about something, reach out, make the connection. Just it's worth having the conversation to get your question answered because there are, there's nothing worse than you struggling to come to a conclusion on which direction to move in, where to go, what investment to make, because that holds up everything. And as we all know, 
it's better to move forward than to try for perfection. Dwayne, this has been a fascinating and amazing conversation. I think there's been so much that you've brought up here in this short amount of time. And I think that folks can probably listen to this two or three times just to get all those concepts if they're not already like uh, an expert like you. Um, I would love for you to kind of uh, tell people how to follow you or reach out to you uh, Look, since I think you're an amazing resource. Looks super easy. I am at Dwayne Forrester on X. You can reach me. Just look up Dwayne Forrester on LinkedIn. I'm happy to connect with rational people. If you're irrational, I might not connect with you. <laughs> Watch for a new sub stack that I'm releasing shortly. I'm easy to find, right? I, I, I am all over the internet at this point. That's why you're a legend. You've been around and you know how to put information out and you have a very unique perspective on things, which I think is extremely valuable here. So yeah, right. thank you so much for your time, Dwayne. Dude, Philip, this is awesome. Everyone who's stayed with us this long, thank you so much. You guys are the best.